I'm Ann Petrick, Senior Director of Research for Vistage, and I am happy to host the latest webinar in our Peak Performer webinar series. This series is designed to support your leadership climb. It brings the most trusted experts to the Vistage community to provide exceptional insights and best practices to help you navigate new challenges and possibilities. Now, morale topped the list of leadership challenges that CEOs are facing today, according to our December CEO Confidence Index survey. And to help leaders address the morale of their team, as well as themselves, we have assembled a panel of Vistage experts to share their insights. Today, we have David Freeman, founder and CEO of High Performing Culture, who has delivered his popular presentation, How to Build a High Performance Culture, the No BS Way to Get It Done, over 500 times to leaders in the Vistage community. He believes that good companies have culture by chance and world-class companies have world-class cultures by design. We're also joined by Dr. Eve Masita, a research psychologist, author, consultant, and award-winning speaker who shared her insights on root causes of stress in July as part of the Leading and Challenging Time series. Today, she shares insights on the hero's journey and what CEOs have learned about themselves during this difficult time. She'll talk about how to navigate your own limits and tap into the empathy necessary for leaders to effectively lead others and maintain morale. And finally, we are joined by Valerie Alexander, CEO of Speak Happiness. Her TED Talk, How to Outsmart Unconscious Bias, has been viewed over 200,000 times and is the foundation of one of her Vistage presentations. Recently, like many of you, she has pivoted to help leaders in times of crisis and has been speaking about how to maximize happiness and engagement when leading remote teams. So welcome everyone. And David, we'll start with you and your view on how morale is a subset of culture. Can you talk about that and share ideas on how CEOs can protect and preserve the culture they've built in this new environment? Sure, and my pleasure. So let me really begin by saying that there's a dynamic that's taken place for companies as it relates to their culture that's been going on for years and the pandemic has just shown a bigger light on it. So let me explain that just to give you the context here. So what we've all seen and all Vistage members have experienced this is that when their companies were smaller, it was relatively easy for them to create and promote the kind of culture they wanted to have. They set a good example, their people were all together, they saw them, and just by the example of the leaders, people figured out, I guess this is what the culture is around here and everything was fine. And as companies grow and they go from five or 10 or 15 people to 30 or 50 or 100 or 200, or maybe they make an acquisition or two, or maybe they, they open up multiple locations, all of a sudden people weren't all together anymore and the leader wasn't touching everybody I don't mean that in a literal way, but people with a leader wasn't seeing everybody every day and people weren't seeing him or her. And as a result, it became harder to manage the culture. Well, the very same thing has been forced upon us by the pandemic. So all of a sudden here comes the pandemic last year. And now even whether they be small or larger companies, people are working remotely and they're no longer seeing each other every day. And those companies, my observation is that those companies who were really intentional and systematic and purposeful and had a methodology about how to build and create their cultures, those companies have actually excelled during this pandemic, that people have banded together and, you know, we're all in this together and we're going to be a team. And they've, they've relied upon the, the, the cultural structure that they had put in place in order to really thrive in this environment. But those companies that didn't, those companies where culture was largely driven simply by physical proximity and there was nothing more structural than that all of a sudden those people are responding to surveys saying oh my god what do we do now you know we used to be proud of our culture it's always been a you know a hallmark of our success and now all of a sudden how do i protect that how do i preserve that how do i make sure that we don't lose all those things that made us so special along the way and that's where they find themselves today and so when we talk about, when they say that I'm worried about morale, they do mean that they're worried about morale, but they, what they mean is in a larger context, they're worried about how they preserve all those things that made their culture special. A big part of what made their culture special was morale, was the, the feeling that people liked working together, they liked being together, they, they responded to each other, they felt like they were part of a team. That's all part of morale. 
but it's really part of a larger concept of what does it mean to have a culture, to have a way that we do things around here? And once again, when we talk about how we do things around here, which is really what culture is. I mean, culture is just the set of behaviors that, 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 that you know, describe and define how we relate to each other, how we relate to customers, how we relate to vendors, how we do things around here. But that's really what culture is. And so if the only way I knew that was we were together, then I lose all that. And so the, what I've been teaching companies for years, and it's only become, again, bigger in this time of the pandemic and all these remote workers, is how to be more systematic. That what leaders need to do is they need to have a specific methodology to create their culture and to be talking about it all the time. And we have, I mean, thankfully, we have Zoom, we have Teams, we have all these other technology tools that enable us to communicate in ways that we didn't before. And so this is the time, if ever there was a time for leaders to be communicating in a more consistent way than they ever did before, this is the time to do it because people are feeling lost. They are feeling disconnected. They are feeling overwhelmed. And this is the time where the best leaders are falling back upon the principles that they have articulated. If these are the principles under which we run our business, well, these are still the same principles under which we run our business. And we can talk about them every day. We can talk about them in meetings. We can gather together. I mean, this is the time where these things become more important than ever. And the best leaders are really doing that. There's an idea around um, rituals as part of culture, and I think mm -hmm. that you know, when we t we think about all of the things that have changed, the, the rituals themselves actually are the ones that are hardest to manifest. How have you seen some companies shift from and, and create new rituals now that are based on the same values, the same behaviors? Yeah, so when we talk about rituals and you know, to, for the audience just to define what we really mean by that, now, when I think about a ritual, I think it is some routine, some habits, something that this is the way we do things around here in a consistent way. And the reason that rituals are so important in good times and in bad times is that most people aren't very good at their ability to stick with things, nor are organizations. When something becomes a ritual, a routine, it's not hard to do. It's just that's our habit. That's what we do. And so rituals are very important to maintain consistency. And so when we have rituals, think about something as simple in a family setting as people before a meal saying a prayer. It's a routine, it's a ritual that centers people, that has them feel connected to something larger. And so the rituals that we can practice around our culture enable people to feel connected to that culture, enable them to feel tied to something enable them to feel there's some sense of normalcy about that. So to your question, one part of the answer to your question is, we should be sticking to a lot of the rituals we've always done, because again, it helps people feel connected that in this chaotic world where everything's changing, there's something that's true, there's something that's enduring, there's something that's lasting. Those principles that we've always talked about in our company, those are enduring principles. Now. Yes, we're working remotely. So some of those things that maybe we used to do, if we all got together in the lunchroom and had you know, a birthday celebration for this month's birthdays, well, we're not all gonna be able to do that together. So clearly we have to make some adaptations. But interesting, I would tell you again, I go back to things like Zoom and Zoom has made it so possible for us to do almost everything that we used to do in person we've been able to do it on Zoom from how we interview people to how we get them onboarded to just about everything that we do. So most of the rituals that, that, would, that would be successful when we're together are just as successful being, doing it on Zoom. And you can do new things. I mean, we've all seen examples of companies that have done, while we're tired of them, have done Zoom happy hours and Zoom get togethers. So they don't even all have to be work-related, but they can be social as well. But Zoom enables us and I say Zoom, but I mean that as an example of video conferencing. If somebody's using another tool, that's fine. But Zoom enables us to do things that we weren't able to do. And I would argue that it, in some ways, this new remote work world, and I should comment that we all know this isn't going away. So yes, we've been in this for a year. And I think it's really important for everyone to understand that when 
when, when it's safer for people to go back to the office, many people aren't going back to the office. So we need to understand that the world of working remotely is here to stay for at least a significant portion of the population. And I would say there are many things that are even better. I mean, our ability to hire and recruit and have people on our teams from all over the country when before we thought we didn't need to do that. I mean, think about recruiting. You can get anybody from anywhere and they can be on your team. And your ability to have people from different offices actually feel more connected to each other today than they used to feel when they felt like we were the poor stepchild because we weren't at the headquarters. Well, yeah. nobody's at the headquarters anymore. We're all poor stepchildren. And so <laughs> in some respects, I would argue that this new remote workforce or remote work world that we're in actually enables us to build stronger bonds in some cases than if we were to be together. And so like a lot, and I know that, that Eve will talk about mindset, and I think if our mindset is, oh my God, we're all working remotely, how is this gonna, we're never gonna be able to protect our culture. Okay, that's one thing. If our mindset is, this is a wonderful opportunity for us to bond in ways that we never did before, I think the remote workforce could be a significant advantage for people. You know, I've heard different things, David, about Zoom because I personally love the opportunity to connect via video. Uh, my boss and I have worked remotely for many, many years, and it took the mm -hmm. pandemic for us to turn on our cameras. And now it's like we're sitting next to each other all the time. It's a little bit overkill, um, but but it took the pandemic for us to do that. And it also, yeah. like you said, you know, feeling like a stepchild. I've always been remote. I feel like it leveled the playing field. Everyone's in their own box in their own office and now you're not just a voice on that uh, speakerphone in the middle of the conference table when everyone's assembled. So I personally like that. But some of the words we saw in morale were uh, Zoom mm -hmm. fatigue or COVID fatigue. And, you know, I understand that there, there's some level of fatigue. Um, what is your view on um, things that you require? Like, um, for example, as part of culture, does everyone have to turn on their cameras or do you have permission to say, you know what, today is a no camera day? Now, how, how do you yeah. suggest that leaders handle that? Yeah, I think that's a good question, Anne, and I'll, I'll comment on that. And I'm sure that, that Eve and Valerie will have comments about this as well. But I would say that this environment requires extraordinary flexibility and understanding and empathy on the part of leaders. And what I mean when I say that is to your point, there are some people, I'm an empty nester. It's easy for me, this isn't that hard. I'm on the camera, my wife's not even home right now, and this is easy. If I was in a small apartment and I had three kids running around and two dogs and the kids are struggling with homework and gotta get food on the table, well, that's a lot more stressful than the world I'm living in. And so it's easy to think from our own perspective that everybody's situation is like ours. And so I think it does take a tremendous amount of understanding, flexibility, empathy, to recognize that people are in all different places about the ways in which this pandemic and working remotely has affected them. For some people, this is great, I love this. And for some, this is unbelievable, fatiguing, stressful, difficult, tiring, exhausting. And so I think to your point, you know, allowing people to have times, where we don't wanna be rigid about, you must be on your camera. We want to allow people you know, to do what works for them and to recognize that that's okay. One of the ways we can do that is just if we, I'm very particular about language, if we notice the way we make a request. So something that I'll often do, even in a Vista's talk, I'll say to people, you know, it's helpful if, if, you're, if you're able to be on camera, we can look at each other and it's easier for us to connect and build a relationship. If you're in circumstance where that doesn't work for you, totally understand. But if you can do so, that'd be great for us to be on camera. Now you're giving people permission to do what works for them, but you're still stating a preference that it would be better if we can do that because we can bond in a stronger way. So I think there are ways for us as leaders in our language to articulate a preference and the reasons for that preference while still allowing plenty of room and flexibility to recognize that people's individual circumstances are different. 
Oh, I love that, David. Thank you. The, the idea of permission and preference. So I think that's yes. a, a great nugget. Now, you mentioned empathy, and I think that that's a great segue to talk um, to Eve. And Eve, you're talking a lot about the hero's journey and what we've learned about ourselves and being able to lead with empathy. So I'm going to turn that over to you to talk about what are, what are the things that you've been working with our members on and, and leaders um, and helping them uh, with their own empathy and their journey through this this time that we've had over the past year. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you. Um, as David mentioned, um, much of my recent career has been spent talking to members and others about the topic of mindset. So fixed mindset and growth mindset. And boy, we're certainly getting an object lesson on the importance of that in the context of 2020 and 2021. And I would say that I've, I sort of accidentally fell into a lot of the conversations I've been having over the last nine or 10 months around hero's journey. Um, back in March, I looked around, tried to think about how could I be helpful as things were really getting crazy and created a, a little five minute video talking about uh, potentially reframing this time as a hero's journey. Um, it was clear to me at that time, even at the very beginning of this, that we were, whether we liked it or not, going to be stepping into history. Uh, this is probably the defining global crisis of our time. I certainly hope that it is. I hope we don't get another one. I hope this this is it. Um, so whether we like it or not, we are living through every day and crafting uh, the legends and the stories of our companies and our families and ourselves. And I thought, what kind of story do we want this to be? Do we want this to be uh, a tragedy, a drama? What What do we want this to be? And I thought about... Uh, the work by Joseph Campbell, which many of us are probably familiar with, this idea of a hero's journey, which essentially has three key parts, which is everything, everything starts off fine, life is normal, predictable, routine, then something catastrophic happens. And then the question becomes, how do we respond to that? And the hero's journey talks about uh, essentially rising to the occasion facing those challenges, overcoming them, and coming out on the other side in an even better place. And I thought, uh, perhaps that would be a helpful framework for all of us to use as we step into this time and think about ourselves as the hero, think about our companies as the hero. And so I spent the last under 10 months uh, speaking with leaders about how do we frame this time for our companies, ourselves, our employees and families uh, as a hero's journey opportunity? How do we intentionally craft the stories we wanna be telling on the other side? Um, and in the course of that, as you might imagine, I've been having some, some pretty vulnerable uh, and authentic and, and just deeply emotional conversations with leaders, with members um, around the world about this topic where we have the opportunity to dive into some of the big challenges in the space for them and for others. And a few things have been become clear to me um, kind of at the, at the individual leader level or the individual human level. Uh, and one is that nobody gets a free pass during this time. No matter how strong, how gritty, how tough, you know, how invincible you think you are, nobody gets a free pass in this one. Um, that's, ju that's just not how it works. Uh, even if you have never cracked under pressure before, guess what? This, this is your turn. This is how it works for all of us. So I just want to normalize anything that folks may be feeling. Um, I have been told repeatedly over the months by uh, by members, so by leaders and by chairs as well. So if any chairs are listening in, this counts for you guys too, uh, you new ladies too, um, that they have been feeling things that they have never felt before, feelings that they have never felt before, things that they thought were exclusively the domain of other people. Uh, so things like anxiety and depression. Uh, and I just want to normalize that that doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with you. It doesn't mean that you're not gonna be fine as you get through this. It means that you're human. Uh, these are extraordinary times. And so I think all of us are realizing that we, ha we do in fact have limits just like everybody else does. Uh, and eventually we're gonna run up against those limits. So again, just wanna normalize uh, if you're feeling stress, if you're feeling anxiety, if you're feeling depression, uh, one, ask for help, whether that's a helping professional or somebody else uh, in your family, your community, your friend zone, um, but don't feel like that in some way makes you feel like you're failing or abnormal because that's what it means to be human right now. And a couple of thoughts around that at the leadership level before I turn my attention to what can we do for our employees? Wanna make sure we're taking care of ourselves first because you can't pour, pour from an empty cup. 
So you want to make sure you get, you're taking care of yourself first. Um, one thing is, uh, I wish there were a less floofy term for this, but self-care, whatever that <laughs> means for you, uh, is the name of the game, whether it's making space for uh, your workouts, however modified they may need to be, whether it's meditation or reading or alone time or appropriately distance uh, social time, you have to be doing the things that take care of you. And I think for a lot of us, we set that aside to take care of other folks. Uh, that for many of us is caught up to us. So making sure we're taking care of the self-care piece of things. And then um, also making sure that we're attending to our own mental and emotional health. I've had a number of folks over the last um, couple of months share with me in the Hero's Journey story sessions that I've been doing where they've been sharing kind of what the story is through the last nine or 10 months or so for their companies. Um, share with me stories of having lost employees mm -hmm. to COVID. Um, and each time that has happened, essentially the exact same thing happened as the person was telling the story. Uh, in the session, and uh, it was basically the person was going along fine, got to that point in the story, and then just broke down, often had to just stop, gather themselves, and each time at some point in that, that sharing, the person said, I thought I was okay, I thought I was over it, and the truth of the matter is, is that this is just harder uh, than probably almost anything that most of us have gone through and recognizing uh, that it's, it's going to take more emotional resources and probably help and support than other things have in the past and giving yourself kind of the self-compassion um, mm -hmm. to take that time. So that's kind of from the leader or the CEO or the individual perspective. I also wanna share a few thoughts on uh, employee morale. So not just managing your own morale and finding a way through this time, giving yourself that self-compassion and grace, but um, what can we be doing to help our employees too? And I think back in a former life, um, I worked for a big business research uh, firm down in Washington, DC on the research team because I'm a really a research uh, psychologist and nerd at heart. And one year we did a big study on employee engagement, just tens of thousands of employees around the world trying to understand what really increases employee engagement and ideally discretionary effort going above and beyond the call of duty to do your best at all times. And we had, I don't know, close to probably a hundred different variables in that study that we investigated. And it was so interesting that the top three drivers of engagement and discretionary effort hung together in a really unique way. Usually when we did a study, the top driver was something, second driver is totally unrelated, third driver is something totally different. Um, but in this study, the hung together in a really interesting way. And the top three drivers, again, of engagement and discretionary effort were in sort of just layman's terms, where do I fit in the grand scheme of things at the organization? Why is what I do important? And how do I do it incredibly well? So where do I fit? Why do I matter? How do I do it incredibly well? And, you know, I think about that in these times. This is something I think that uh, research shows employees struggle with most of the time, even when we're there in person with our boss um, and each other every single day. Um, we don't often as leaders do a very good job of providing this understanding for our employees, particularly as things change over time, um, as their role changes over time, as our mission changes over time and so on. I think it presents a really unique challenge now when so many folks are remote. Um, so if we're if we didn't historically do a good job at this when we sat in the same office or you know worked on the same job site with somebody, it's going to take a little bit more effort to connect those dots for people um, in a remote setting. And then I think also it's not just the remote nature of work that creates an uh, additional ripple here. It's the fact that things are changing so quickly. You know, it's not like we can just do this once and then let it, you know, let it ride because we're good <laughs> on that. Uh, the nature of work and the nature of the world is that things are changing so quickly that we may need to revisit this on a periodic basis. Um, so making sure that we understand that these things are critical and that they are incredibly high return. Um, one of the things I loved about the fact that these were the biggest drivers of engagement and discretionary effort was they're free. Mm, you know, yeah. this, this is not a $10,000 bonus for everybody. This is not an extra week of PTO. Uh, this is not a Maserati for everybody. <laughs> this is, I mean, it takes a little bit of time and effort, but it's essentially free 
And it's something that everybody can have. And that for me, I think, um, was one of the most powerful things about uh, that particular study. So again, making sure that we're intentional about that and uh, we make that small investment for a really big return. Yeah, that's interesting, the idea of engagement. And I know, Valerie, from our conversation that you probably have a lot to say about this. So thank you, Eve, and we'll transition to Valerie. And then um, after Valerie, we'll all come back together because I'm sure you all have comments on each other's um, perspectives. So Valerie, um, when Eve spoke to engagement, and I know you have the perspective about connecting engagement to happiness. So can you talk about some of those things? And I know that you have some, some thoughts about key drivers as well. Sure. The managerial behavior that gets you engagement is the exact same managerial behavior that gets you happiness from your employees. But engagement is management focused. Oh, we have a visitor and I want the, I didn't expect this to happen, but I thought it might and I will share. This is one of the things we also have to make sure everybody is okay with. Your employees live in a home where they have kids, they have dogs, they have somebody's going to walk behind them in the background and be the leader who makes that as okay as possible. The added level of stress that is caused if somebody has to think, oh no, what if I'm gonna get in trouble for this? What if I'm embarrassing myself? That is so unnecessary in your workplace. So make sure everything is okay if it happens. I wasn't expecting him to do that, but <laughs> I, I'm okay with it. And I know that the people watching are okay with it. As a leader, make sure you convey that to your people. But going back to what I was talking about with happiness and engagement. As a leader, you want your employees to be engaged, but as an employee, that person doesn't care about engagement and nobody likes to hear that, but they really do care about their happiness. Nobody ever got home at the end of the day and said, wow, I felt so engaged in work today. They said, I was so happy in my job today. Uh, and the analogy I use is, which does your spouse want to hear? I wanna make you more engaged in this relationship or I wanna make you happier in this relationship. Think about that with your employees. And here is the incredibly convenient fact, it's the same behavior as a manager. And when Eve was just talking about her research, that is exactly in line with all the other research in this area. There's three long ranging happiness in the workplace studies in this country. One is Harvard Business School, one is UC Riverside, and one is Gallup, and you're probably quite familiar with Gallup. Uh, I highly recommend download State of the American Workforce. They all come to the same conclusion. They all come to the exact same conclusion that Eve did, which is the main driver, the main driver of employee happiness is their sense of accomplishment. UC Riverside calls it the sense of accomplishment. Harvard Business School calls it making progress on work that matters. Gallup calls it being able to put your skills to their best use. Eve just mentioned in her, in her study, it was what do I do that matters and how can I do it really well? So the thing that gets people up in the morning and to their desk or to their computer or to their work site is feeling like they're doing something, feeling like they're getting something accomplished, feeling like something is making a difference and that gets really robbed in a lot of remote workforces. Because a lot of leaders, their version of management is what we call MBWA. <laughs> management by walking around. And if your team is now remote, you have to be really intentional. That is the binary difference between the way you used to manage and the way you manage now. David's absolutely right. All of this got accelerated. Cultures that were accidental became more accidental. Cultures that were intentional became more intentional. Everything you used to do by accident, when, when an engineer and a marketing person met up at the water cooler and the marketing person learned the new features of the, to, to be able to talk about, that isn't happening right now. So everybody has to be intentional. And as a leader, you have to be really intentional about where your workforce is getting their sense of accomplishment. Make sure you know what everybody is doing, what they're working on. There's the triple A that say, when your car breaks down, you call triple A. Triple A saves a lot of things. And in your workplace, here's how triple A saves you. Accomplishment, which is what your employees want. They want a sense of accomplishment. Autonomy, 
which was again the second pillar that Eve mentioned, which is how do I do my job well? People don't want to be hovered over at all times. But and the, and the third one is acknowledgement. So accomplishment, autonomy, acknowledgement. If you can give your workforce all three of those things every day, they are going to love their jobs. They will be happy. It doesn't matter whether they're all in the same office, whether they're at their in their workforce, whether they have kids walking around in the background. None of that happens if they feel a sense of accomplishment from their job, if they feel they're able to do it to the best of their abilities, put their own skills to use, which is autonomy, and if they hear back from someone, the attaboy, the you're doing a great job, you are contributing to our successful outcomes, the acknowledgement, those three things alone are going to get you your best possible outcomes. So, so Valerie, you pivoted to talking about remote, and I guess I wonder, you know, with this kind of ties back to what David was saying about rituals and culture. You know, there's one thing to have an attaboy that's, you know, maybe um, direct connection, but what about the more public things? Like in a remote workforce, how do I get that uh, recognition that maybe I got in an all hands meeting or something like that? Mm -hmm. How are you seeing leaders really provide that more public acknowledgement? Well, one of the things as a leader you have to, again, be intentional about is what people are doing each day. Now, I assume you're having some type of all hands meeting at least once every other week or like where an entire group is all on the same Zoom. I assume not everything is one-to-one -one anymore. So if you have everybody in the same Zoom, make sure you're pointing out what people are doing, what they're getting right. When I do the happiness in the workplace platform for, for Vistage, there's happiness for remote teams is a little bit of crisis management, a lot more about being intentional, and a lot more about things like video conferencing, best practices, and other issues around that. But when I do the full happiness in the workplace platform, one of the tips I give managers is call everybody in each of your direct reports. Call them in at the end of every month and ask that person. You say, we don't have an employee of the month program. And by the way, I hope you don't have an employee of the month. I could go into a whole separate thing about why. <laughs> but, but you say, we don't have an employee of the month program. But if we did and you were going to be the employee of the month this month, what would you get it for? And you do that one-on-one. -on -one. You do that separately behind a closed door, not in front of everybody. Now, the first time you ask, people are going to think it's a little weird. Your female employees are going to defer to other people. <laughs> but, um, but drill down and say, what did you do that would have given you employee of the month this month? Mm -hmm. Again, the first time they're going to think it's a little strange. The second time, the, at the end of the second month, they'll say, okay, I get this. I'll answer that question. By the end of the third month, they're thinking of things during the month. They do something that, oh, this might make me employee of the month. And by the fourth month, your employees are doing things so that they have something to tell you. It becomes the most motivating thing you can do is ask somebody if, and the beauty of it is at the end of the year, you now have 12 data points. You yeah. have 12 data points for what somebody did that contributed to your outcomes. And those are the things that then you can turn around. You wanna give everybody a sense of accomplishment? Put that in a newsletter. They, these are employees of the month this month and have everybody's name listed and have what they each did that month. It's also a really good way to see who thinks they're doing a lot more than everybody else because yeah. that is another destabilizing factor. And it's human nature to think you're doing more than you're actually doing and that everyone else is doing less than they're actually doing. Yeah. And yeah, this is a really good way to bring everybody into check. It's a good way to see when everyone's remote, if five people all think they're the single one responsible for that big contract you just got. Okay, wait, who actually did what? Mm -hmm. So that's a very simple, easy technique and a method to give people a sense of accomplishment, for you as a leader to evaluate what they're doing and then to find a way to give them acknowledgement. And last thing on this, if you have a group meeting and you're giving acknowledgement, make sure it's spread around evenly. Make sure that the next group meeting, somebody who maybe wasn't mentioned the last time gets to hear their name. Make sure that you're not only rewarding the people who put out the fires, but that you're rewarding the people who prevented fires from starting in the first place. Mm -hmm. 
Well, that's a, a great point. And I, I wonder, so you think about, you know, if you're not feeling accomplished or getting the acknowledgement and, you know, that's impacting morale, you know, what are the, how can you identify an employee who is just maybe experiencing some down morale versus somebody who's just a generally toxic employee, right? If someone's not contributing, they're not engaged, how do you identify, okay, this is somebody who's clearly experiencing a morale problem versus someone right. who is or has become toxic? The, the become toxic is what you want to investigate. If you have someone who is toxic, and I, I always ask when I'm in any session, any speaking, have you ever worked at a company where someone was toxic? Raise your hand. All the hands go up. And I said, raise your hand if management knew they were toxic and didn't do anything about it. And every hand stays up. So I will say right now, if you're a leader in an organization and you know somebody is toxic to your workplace, do something about it immediately. Your toxic people cost you your best people. But if someone's always been good and now they're transitioning to becoming toxic, that is a conversation you really want to have as soon as possible. Find out what's going on in their life. Find out what is happening with them. And toxic behavior has to be corrected right away. And the best way to do that, I will share with everybody. If you're a leader, the phrase you want to use and write this down is, I'm wondering if you're aware. Behind a closed door, you say to somebody, I'm wondering if you're aware of what happens to our entire workforce when you scream at people. I'm wondering if you're aware how much the company is affected by the kind of gossip that you seem to be spreading. That, that's a conversation starter. Now, yeah. keep in mind, yeah, when you're talking to someone toxic, here's the thing you as a leader have to remember. This is a conversation, but it's not a negotiation. <laughs> They're going to have responses that might deflect or might make it seem like they don't have to change. You can make it very clear this behavior is going to change. But I spoke for a large real estate organization where one of the questions I got, they said, we have someone who we love. She's been with us 20 years and she has just become really toxic. And I said, what's going on? And they said, she's going through a really bitter divorce. And I said, well, provide her with resources. Do you have an EAP, an employee assistance program? And they said, no. I said, all right, then set aside $500 and privately behind a closed door say, we have $500 for you to get some counseling for what you're going through. Don't hold that against that person. And that's times 10 in COVID. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you know this and I'll share it. Um, my, my father died of COVID on Christmas. So sorry. Yeah. On Christmas, my father died of COVID and I got the news. We had our quiet small family Christmas at home that we were having anyway. And then the next day I went grocery shopping and I didn't think anything of it. And two people were walking the opposite way down the aisle towards me and their masks were down here. They're down, you know, as mm -hmm. we call chin diapers. And I saw them and I said, oh, excuse me, could you put your masks up? And they just kept walking right past me without moving their masks. And then later I was at the meat counter where all the meat was and they were both leaning over meat, masks still down here. And I just lost it. I was screaming at them in the grocery store to, well, you can imagine what I was screaming. <laughs> the manager had to come over and luckily the manager took my side and the people, you know, hustled their way out of the, I haven't screamed at a stranger in a store in my <laughs> life. Like who was that person? Oh, that's the person who just lost her father to COVID. And First off, quick PSA, wear a mask. Wear a mask everywhere you go. Wear a mask every time you're outside your house. I wear a mask to walk my dog, even though I'm outside in my neighborhood, because I don't know what that other person who might be walking towards me on the sidewalk is experiencing. And I don't know if I'm carrying it. I don't know if I've got it and could be spreading it to someone else. But so tiny PSA, politics aside, wear a mask every time you leave your house. But within your workforce, you don't know what somebody is going through right now. And if suddenly somebody who 
has never screamed at anybody, is has become toxic, be on that person's side. Don't be another source of stress or discomfort for them. Be what they need in order to get past that and go back to being the amazing employee you've always known that person to be. Thank you so much. I, I have been saying for now probably almost a year, no one's at their best in the pandemic and that the best thing that we can do is, is be treat ourselves with grace and treat others with grace as well because uh, we're all experiencing this at different times. And so as I invite you all to come back on for our question and answer session and have some conversation, uh, I hope that you had the opportunity to listen to Simon Sinek because he talks about trauma and that no one escapes the trauma of COVID. So that's exactly what you said, Eve, is that no one escapes the trauma and learning how to identify when it is that you're experiencing this uh, yourself to be able to take uh, some efforts to, to mitigate those, those challenges, but also um, being very graceful, understanding that someone else is going to go through it at a different time and maybe in a different way. And so that I think that brings us back to, you know, hero's journey and a lot of the things that we're experiencing. So, so David, I want to go to you first. And um, we've yeah. heard from, from Eve and Valerie. Um, do you have any comments about their, their comments about engagement and how that might manifest yeah. itself and connect back to culture? Yeah. So what I would say, what struck me most in Valerie and Eve's comments is, and it's something I talk about all the time, is this thought, this word that of intentionality that mm -hmm. both of them commented about how hey when we were all together we could rely on the water cooler conversation the the ad hoc random conversations that take place but when we're working remotely it requires a lot more intentionality and what i would add to that and i think this is a really important point is it's one thing to say yeah i'm going to be a lot more intentional yeah i'm going to do that except life gets in the way and we don't and so what does it take to be more intentional? It takes a process. It takes structure. It takes rituals, a system. And so I'll give you a very simple example of this from you know, my first company that, that when I was CEO of that company, I knew that I was not very good at the acknowledgement that Eve and Valerie both talk about. Uh, classic male behavior, though not strictly male, female, but I wasn't very good at it. And yet I knew how important it was. And so I had to teach myself to get better at it. And so what I did is, and I just use this as an example, is I, I use a task management system that I can set up repeating tasks, things that'll come up every Tuesday, every fifth Friday, whatever. I had a repeating, I had two repeating tasks for years that came up every three days. One of them said, do a written acknowledgement. The other said, do a personal acknowledgement. And what it forced me to do is to, one, tune up my awareness of things that were worthy of acknowledgement, but more importantly, it forced me to act upon those and to create a habit of regularly, consistently doing these things. If I had sat back and said, I got to be more intentional about that, I'd have the greatest intention to be intentional <laughs> and it wouldn't happen because life gets in the way. And so everything, if, I, if there's one thing I've learned about all of this stuff, it's you've got to create a structure for these things to take place. Every meeting, we do an acknowledgement at the beginning. Every third Tuesday, we do this thing. Every Wednesday, we do that. There needs to be a routine about it. If there's not a routine about it, and we're just trying to remember to be better about it, we're not going to remember to be better about it. We're just not. And so I think I couldn't agree more with the comments about the importance of being intentional. And what I would add to that is you don't get intentional over a consistent period of time without putting some structure in place to support that. Oh, Valerie, Eve, do you have any comments on that? I love that. It's it's funny. I ran a tech company for three years that that was our product. It was called the Happy Couples Spot. Oh. It was literally to send couples reminders of what to do for each other to make to maintain the happiness in their relationship. So getting a written reminder is does not make it does not mean you're being any less thoughtful. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. one of the best things you can do. Pro program your calendar. Everybody has, a, you have a calendar on your phone, program the calendar on your phone to tell you these things. Yes. Oh. Um, this is reminding me recently, I uh, went through one of many types of assessments that you can have about your people and this, you know, and how people um, engage or prefer to be communicated with. 
Um, do you think those are helpful tools right now in, in remembering? Because what I actually learned is that I overcompensate. So David, I you know tend to get right to business. Let's do this. Here's the task, blah, blah, blah. So it is not a male, female thing. I just want to get everything done. Um, but I, I find myself going back in emails being like, hello, David, I hope this finds you well. I hope you had a great weekend. <laughs> Uh, but but maybe you know we're going overboard with that. So talk about how we can really tailor some of our communications to to the individuals that we're we're working with. Well, I, I love I have to okay. I have to hop in because I love no I love that you ask it this way. One of the worst things we ever learned in society is treat others the way you want to be treated. <laughs> it, it, it comes from the Bible which was do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. When Jesus spoke those words, he was quoting Leviticus, so it's both Old Testament and New Testament, talking about how to treat your enemies. Literally, that passage of the Bible is about how to treat your enemies. And somehow we translate that into the golden rule. No, 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 you don't treat people the way you want to be treated. You treat people the way they want to be treated. And one of the things that happened with remote workforces is leaders were just like, oh, okay, I'm supposed to check in with people every day. Or managers who had nothing to do suddenly, like their management was by walking around and now suddenly they don't really know what to do. They're checking in constantly. And there were people who were like, why is my manager checking in every hour or every two hours? I never needed that before, that never happened before. And then there's people on the flip side who are saying, I wish my manager was checking in more often well, simple solution, ask everybody. Ask people, what do you need from me? What do you need from me for you to effectively do your job? How can I provide support for you to make progress? Yeah. So and I'll then just... David's calendar reminders could be, you know, talk to Anne on Tuesday and uh, make a phone call to Valerie on th every Thursday, right? So just understanding right. that preference uh, and be able to mind that. Go ahead, yeah, and, and, oh. uh, yeah, one, gonna... last, one last comment. and. and uh, Tagging on to what Valerie was saying about when you were talking, Valerie, about the the app that you had, that technology, to your point, doesn't make that less meaningful because I use technology. The technology is simply a reminder to now act in ways that you know you want to act. And so these are not contradictions. They're support to help you be the way you want to be, whatever that may be. I'm sorry, Eve, go ahead. No, all good. We just all have good things to add to Valerie's awesome comment. Um, and, and, you know, again, I, I also couldn't agree more with what Valerie said. There's there's no substitute for just asking people what their preference is and not assuming that other people prefer the same things that you do. Um, and I think one of the things that I found particularly helpful, whether it's in COVID times or regular times, is um, asking questions in a way that makes it okay for people to tell you the things that they're afraid to tell you. So in addition to saying like, what can I do for you that's going to um, make you happier, make you more engaged at work, also asking something like, okay, what am I doing that's getting in the way of you being as engaged or as happy um, as possible? If I could wave a magic wand and take out of the way the one thing that's creating the biggest set of problems for you, what would that be? So making sure um, that you're asking questions that make it okay for people to talk about the stuff that they're scared to share with you potentially as a leader too. Yeah, that goes uh, back one, to one, the idea of yeah. permission and preference, right, David? Yeah, and, and one thing I would, I would add to that as well, in my experience, when you're asking for somebody for that feedback, whether it's the thing I should stop doing or the thing I should do more of, I find if you ask for a specific number, like you just said, Eve, what's the one thing I could do? Name two things I could do that would be helpful. People seem to take that seriously. Like I have to actually think about that. If you ask, is there anything I could do to be more helpful? Nah, I can't really think of it. If I think of anything, I'll let you know. I don't take the questions seriously. But if you say, what are the two most important things I could do to be supportive? Well, I guess it, I start thinking about it in a serious way. So giving them a specific number, one or two is a good number because it's less intimidating. I find people take the question seriously. Very interesting. So David, I want to come back to you with another question because, you know, yeah. tying this into our survey and thinking about, um, you know, 
2021, um, you know, we're headed into this. We do know that many of our members are planning to expand. They're growing, whether through acquisition or um, expanding their workforce. I believe our latest statistic is 64% intend to add um, headcount in 2021, which is great. So how do these new team members, how do you onboard these people and instill them in the aspects of culture when you are distributed, disparate, if you're in a remote environment, how do you how do you preserve that? Because if you're adding to your mass, then you would think that if they're not properly onboarded, that might actually dilute your culture. Yeah, that's a great question. So a couple of things I'd say, first of all, and, and so much of this comes back to clarity. I'm always about clarity. If I'm crystal clear as a leader about what my culture is or what I'm trying to have it be, it's a heck of a lot easier for me to communicate it to new people that I'm onboarding than if, well, our culture is just kind of like, we like each other, like, what is that? I don't know how to teach any of that. So the clearer I am and the more specific I am about the principles that drive our culture, the more intentional I can be about bringing those new people in and teaching them very specifically, articulating for them, these are the things that are important to us and then demonstrating those through the things that we do. Now, when we think about how we bring people in, clearly, if we were all physically together, there are events, things that take place that help people to get a sense of, of what our culture is like above and beyond the principles that are important to us. And we can replicate some of that stuff. It's not the same, but we can do that. And I'll give you a simple example because I've had somebody we just hired this week um, who we're bringing on board. I've been thinking about this. So one of the things that we're scheduling is, so how does this person get to know all of our people? Well, we're actually scheduling a series of sessions, of Zoom sessions with three or four of our existing people and this new person for them to have a, a scheduled time where, you know, if we've got 15 people, all right, three or three or three of our existing people are with them this day and another three on this day, another three on this day, so that they can have some time together with a question that they can talk about just to get to know each other, just to have a little, you know, a 20 minute, 30 minute session, just to be together and get to know each other some. But going back to our comments, that has to be intentional. That has to be scheduled because before this, that would have happened on its own. We can't count on that now. Mm -hmm. So there are things like that that we can do to purposely arrange opportunities for people to get to know each other. And I'm completely confident that they can get to know each other, each other just as well. And as was mentioned earlier, we don't have geographic boundaries, so we can actually get to know each other better than we might have before because we're not limited by the, ge by the geography of it all. So I think it, it comes back to being crystal clear about what it is we're trying to teach the new people we bring in and then being intentional and structured around how do we create events and opportunities using Zoom for people to get to know each other better. Mm -hmm. So a lot of intentionality I'm hearing. Um, all, even, it's all yeah. intentionality. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm curious, Eve, because we all have mission creep or we all have our not so good days and weeks. And when Simon um, came and spoke to us, he talked about some of the things, you know, you can't sleep or just feeling mm -hmm. super disengaged and not productive. Um, what are some of the manifestations you're seeing in your work with members that, that are, you know, their when they can recognize that they're they're triggered and that they they need that help. Ooh, my goodness! Um, <laughs> so many things here. Um, uh, unusual emotional outbursts, right, Valerie? Like completely understand, <laughs> completely appropriate emotional outbursts, but an unusual emotional outburst, right? Mm -hmm. So feeling uh, emotions that you don't normally feel, uh, intensity of emotions that you don't normally feel, um, difficulty sleeping, nightmares actually, I find is a big one. And then another one, and there's a, there's a lot of um, really interesting emergent research in this space, and this is where my psychology nerd background comes into place, um, mysterious physical pains and ailments. So like your old shoulder injury is acting up, your back is acting up, your migraines are acting up, and there's no physical cause for these. There hasn't been an injury, there hasn't been anything there. Um, but one of the things that we're finding in research is that um, emotional energy, if not acknowledged and discharged, can turn into physical 
manifestations. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the research around this is emergent and so interesting. And I sort of think about it, um, I think it's like the first law of thermodynamics, right? That energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It can simply change form. Change. And so if we're not attending to emotional um, and mental uh, energy difficulties, they can show up in other places. So think about, you know, again, has your shoulder been acting up, your lower back, your migraines, your whatever, um, that can be your body's way of telling you that there's something that you need to attend to. Mm -hmm. and, and I actually, I want to hop in here. So also as a, as a leader, one of the things you have to be really aware of with your employees, in, with anybody in your life really, is the way our brain works, which is the amygdala is our fight or flight center. It's the source of like the amygdala engages the hypothalamus, the hypothalamic pituitary axis, <laughs> tells the adrenal glands, release cortisol. That's cortisol is your response to any stress. It's your response to any fear. It increases our glucose levels. It's it's why certain communities have higher levels of diabetes because the they're mm -hmm. under a much higher state of fear at all times. So when we have more fear, we have higher cortisol levels, we have higher glucose levels. COVID is causing people to live in an extended state of fear. Yeah. And the uncertainty you have about your job, if you don't know if you're doing it well or not. Um, all David and Eve and I are all speakers. We've all had this experience where when at the end of a talk, you give a great talk, you end, you know what you usually get? applause from an audience and then you're in that room with them and then you talk to a couple of them now literally i will end a talk that i know i just killed it and they end meeting and suddenly i'm looking at a blank screen yeah. um and so all that feedback that would dissipate cortisol in the bat in the past is gone as well and what the one point i have to make that is so important in terms of brain functionality is when your amygdala is engaged your prefrontal cortex shuts down and the prefrontal cortex is where we have our social interaction, our control of emotions, and our complex decision making. If you're in a state of heightened fear, this is why Navy SEALs train in a state of heightened fear mm -hmm. so that you can make good decisions. The rest of us, we don't have that kind of training. So if you're in a state of heightened fear, you're literally not capable of making as good decisions. You're literally not capable of having so as much control of your emotions. We're having positive so as many positive social interactions and we have to acknowledge what state of fear people are experiencing right now and how that's affecting their base brain activity yeah. excellent all right well before we leave i wanted to ask all of you um so one of the things that probably is impacting leaders own morale and morale in the organization is maybe everyone's different uh, philosophies, thresholds, uh, approach, fear um, of, of the pandemic and their own personal behaviors. So as a leader, what is the best way that you can help manage that and get everyone on the same table um, in terms of acting um, accordingly and following policies and having it not be a political or a theoretical conversation, but just something that everyone's working together towards. What are your, your feelings on that? David, I'll start with you. So I, I would you know, come back to something I said earlier about um, extreme degrees of flexibility um, that, and, and even Valerie commented in similar ways that these are unprecedented times. People are under levels of stress as we've been talking about all afternoon um, that are not situations people have been in before. And so we as leaders, I think we clearly still have to have guardrails, which I, I constantly come back to principles. What are the bedrock principles that are, what are important to us? But principles aren't rules. Principles are, are guidelines for how we think about things. What's important to us? What are the beliefs we have? So we have to fall back upon those but there's a lot of room inside those guardrails to allow for flexibility, to allow to recognize, as we talked about earlier, that everybody's circumstances are different, their personal circumstances are different, their, the stresses they have in their families and in their children, their parents, the other things they're dealing with. And so we just have to have, I, I think it's always been important to be flexible, but it's more important now than it's ever been. So I think we can at the same time, flexibility doesn't mean anything goes. Hey, you know, it's a pandemic. I can't complain. Anything's okay. No, mm -hmm. we can have guardrails set by our principles, but inside those guardrails, we as leaders can 
be and demonstrate an extraordinary amount of flexibility and understanding for the things our people are going through. Excellent. Over to you, Eve. Yeah, so I mean, I totally agree with everything that David just said there. You know, we're in an, a unique position, I think, especially now of having to walk that tightrope between uh, individual flexibility and making sure there are really clear guardrails. Again, I'm a psychologist. Boundaries are good. Boundaries are healthy for healthy relationships of all types, whether they're personal relationships or professional relationships. So um, having real clarity around what the boundaries are and clearly communicating why those boundaries exist, I think is hugely unhelpful. And then I think also, you know, I'll, I'll share like a really specific technique that I have found helpful, um, you know, well before pre-COVID, anytime you've got somebody in your life, whether it's personal or professional, this works better maybe in a professional setting, but you probably modify it for personal too. So if you've got somebody who's not behaving in a way that you need them to, again, whether this is COVID related or not, saying, this is how you're behaving now, this is how we need you to behave instead and being really specific about both of those things and clarifying this is why this is the behavior we need instead. And then asking the person, what would it take for you to behave in this way? And then see what they say. Because mm. I don't wanna have to guess. I don't wanna have to dictate it. I say, this is where you are. This is what we need instead. What would it take for you to behave in this way? And you see what the person says, but you put it on them. Um, if they come back with something unreasonable, it's going to take a pony. Well, you know what? We're not doing a pony. So that's, we're, we're done. Um, or if they say, I'm not gonna, we're also mm -hmm. done. But it is a way of reframing the conversation so that the burden is upon that person to solve the problem, not for you to solve it for them. So it might be something to think about um, in these times as well. Excellent. Thank you so much. And Valerie, final words from you. I will add that nobody changes from a position of being comfortable with where they are. Mm -hmm. And if we really want people to change their approach, change their behavior, the first thing we have to do is get them to care. That, that you have to care about the other people. You have to care about the positions other people are in. And we get to that through storytelling and empathy. If as a leader, if you can build the empathy in your workforce towards each other, you are going to get such greater outcomes. So maybe bring people together. If you have somebody who is not behaving in a way that gives everybody else in the workplace comfort, maybe you give everyone the opportunity to share some stories, to share what their experiences are, to share why they're afraid or why they're not comfortable in this situation. And I heard yesterday, I spoke with a Vistage chair who was having an in-person meeting. And I said, that's bold. And he said, well, here's, I've got wristbands and the red wristband is the person who says, stay away from me, get, have a mask when you're within 10 feet of me and stay away otherwise. And the yellow wristband is the people are like, I'm okay being around you, but I'm gonna have a mask and you should have a mask. And the green wristband are for people who don't care. And he said, so everyone walks into the meeting, they choose their own wristband and everyone else just has to respect that. And I thought that is a great solution maybe for workplaces where, if you have to have people around, let somebody wear the wristband, a red wristband that says, don't come within 10 feet of me and you better have a mask on. And just make sure everybody respects everybody else's position. I always say, fake it till you make it. If, if, you're, if somebody in your workforce doesn't respect someone else, fine. They don't have to respect that person, but they better treat them with respect. They better show respect for them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was a great, a great story. I could talk to all of you all afternoon, but thank you for ending with that story. And thank you so much for your time and sharing your insights with us today. Very valuable for uh, our members or all of us dealing with uh, morale and morale of our teams. Um, looking ahead, we do have two webinars that will be part of our Peak Performer webinar series planned that you can actually register for today. On February 26th, uh, UBS expert James Jack returns to share his insights on tax planning and considerations under a new administration. Again, that's February 26th. And on March 12th, Aisha Tompkins from Insperity will share insights on making inclusion a part of your organizational culture. So all of these part of our peak performer series designed to help you in your, your leadership climb. So thank you so much again to our experts who were with us today. Our um, pleasure. Everyone.
Yeah, thank you. And be safe and be well.